You are listening to Geek Fest Rants on the IC Robots Radio Network. You have located Geek Fest Rants, the entertainment podcast for genre geeks like you. Shall we play a game? Covering the world of vintage and current film and television since 2010. Game over, man. Game over. Featuring in-depth conversations on sci-fi, horror, fantasy, comics, toys, and conventions. So say we all. So say we all. And now sit back, relax, and enjoy today's show. I have something here for you. Your father wanted you to have this when you were old enough, but your uncle wouldn't allow it. He feared you might follow old Obi-Wan on some damn fool idealistic crusade like your father did. Sir, if you'll not be needing me, I'll close down for a while. Sure, go ahead. What is it? Your father's lightsaber. This is the weapon of a Jedi Knight. Not as clumsy or random as a blast. An elegant weapon for a more civilized age. For over a thousand generations, the Jedi Knights were the guardians of peace and justice in the Old Republic. Before the dark times. Before the Empire. Hi, everybody, and welcome once again to Geek Fest Rants. My name is Carlos Perone, and today we are going to be highlighting lightsabers, Star Wars lightsabers. Not necessarily the uh, the history or how they're manufactured, you know, canon-wise, but authentic sabers you can buy from a collecting point of view. And I'm talking about the ones that you can actually light up, but they're not the kitty ones. They're the a little more advanced, a little more expensive, a little more fancy lightsabers and how they've been progressing and actually exchanging companies through the years and I will talk about my particular collection and some of its best features about them. So let's get started with lightsabers. You can collect them all. You are a toy! Batteries not included. Get those wonderful Details on specially marked packages at participating stores. Is that the six million dollar man's boss? It's Oscar Goldman. Why do you have that? That's worth a lot of money. That's much more valuable than Steve Austin. Action figures each sold separately. Hi, I'm Chucky, and I'm your friend to the end. Some assembly required. All your favorite Star Wars heroes and villains. I have three of each. One to display, one to open, and one just in case. All right, I like to talk about lightsabers a little bit today, and similar to how we did with the Land Speeder, I want to cover the toy development in terms of the first original ones and the most recent ones that we have now, you know, the fanciest, best-looking ones available at this point. But before that, as usual, I'd like to give a little background on the actual prop, on the actual, you know, theoretical item that is a lightsaber. Now, as far as the films go, when it came time to design this particular weapon, which was going to be, obviously, you know, a very high point in the film. It was a very iconic item that kind of defined, in a way, the story of Luke Skywalker. In order to build at least the hill part of it, what I read on the Roger Christian book, which I recently also used, you know, to do some of the extra research on the land speeder, was that what he ended up doing was going to a prop store, basically, places where they go and buy used materials and turn it into something else. And again, developing on this theory of just building on other materials and adding more materials to it. He was able to find a box, from what I understand, full of Graflex flash holders. Now, what I'm talking about a flash holder is, if you think of the old-timey cameras, like in the 30s and the 40s, where the photographer is holding this huge camera in his hand with a stick to one side of the camera with a giant, giant flash bulb, you know, the type of flash bulbs that... You know, you take a picture and then they change the light and they take another picture and they change the light because those are like, they can only use them once, not like the more modern flashes, you know, of the 60s and 70s that kind of recharge themselves and you can take another picture. 
Well, the actual holder, that, that cylindrical stick that holds the flash that attaches to the camera, that's what ended up being the iconic, you know, Luke's lightsaber. So he, he took that, he added uh, some parts, you know, a calculator uh, display and little tiny light bulbs and all kinds of little tiny, you know, not a lot. Because again, if you look at Luke's lightsaber, it's not super, super crazy uh, decorated. And at the end of the actual hilt, he also added these black rubbery grip slips or bars, if you will. And he was able to kind of decorate the bottom of it in that manner. So it almost, you know, feels like it's a, it's more of a gripping action kind of thing. Now, granted, the saber had to be long enough to be able to be held with two hands, uh, you know, adult hands, obviously. And, you know, by adding all these little extra pieces, you end up with the finished product. Now, this is a concept that was used for a lot of the props. Uh, I think they called them greeblies. That's just a name they gave it in terms of taking a device that might be familiar looking to us and adding a whole bunch of little things to make it look different, futuristic in a way. Now, that at least solved the problem of what these things are going to look like. So in other words, you know, when you think of a sword hilt, you're thinking most likely of either like a Japanese katana where it's a very long, you know, hilt. Uh, or maybe more like a King Arthur type of sword, like a traditional Middle Ages sword. You know, you hold it with one hand, even maybe even two hands, whatever. But it's all metal and all fancy and carved out and everything. But no, this gave you something that, again, was mechanical. You know, it wasn't something that was ornate. It was almost more like a tool. You know, it wasn't meant to be something that's very fancy looking. And portable, obviously, you know, not too much of a of a guard, you know, on either side, like a traditional sword would have a guard. This is more like the, the Kylo Ren style I'm talking about, where it has the guard, the cross guards on either side. But no, no guard at all. And I think in the mythology of lightsabers, I think it is at some point it is said that it could have been uh, originally a tool that was adapted to, you know, something like that. But at least it gave us something to start with. And that's how we all kind of start, is with Luke's lightsaber. Now, to create the effect of the actual blade for the film, the original intent was, well, you take this nice hilt that you designed, and you attach a metal rod to simulate the sword itself, the blade. So we take this metal rod and we cover it with a reflective material all from top to bottom. And inside the hilt, we're going to put a little motor that makes the whole thing spin. So in other words, the blade will spin in a circle, you know, as a person is holding it. And as this thing rotates, light catches the reflective material on the blade will be caught by the lights of the set, special lights that they're going to add. And on camera, you know, on film, it will give it this glowing look because it was, I guess it was a trick that they could do to a certain extent to make something glow, you know, by putting a reflective uh, material on it and lighting it a certain way. And the, the reason why they would do the, the spinning is that this way the reflection is even out of all, you know, sides of the blade. So you can't just put it on one side because then the blade turns, you lose the glow. So in order to maintain that, reflection, not only are you covering the rod, you know, with the reflective material, but you're also spinning it around. So it's always constantly in the same, you know, angle, you know, being hit by the lights, no matter what the angle of the individual holding the sword is. Now for this to work, the other problem was that they really couldn't fit a battery inside of the hilt. So what they did is they ran a cable out of the bottom of the hilt into whoever is holding the sword's sleeve, let's say, and inside the sleeve, they would have a, a little battery uh, attachment that, that, that they would kind of attach to the inside of the sleeve. And that is something that, if you look very carefully, you can catch that a few times in the movie, Star Wars, A New Hope. I know, for example, when Obi-Wan is getting ready to fight Darth Vader, right around the time he's pulling the sword up and igniting it, you could actually see there is a wire coming out of his wrist from the bottom of the lightsaber into his sleeve, and you can even almost see a, a little battery pack in there. It's very quick, very, you know, it comes and goes. So that was the theory. The theory is that that's how we're going to do it. 
So they're going to do it that way. Now, because of that, because you're dealing with an electrical device that not only is it electrical, but it's mechanical. You have power going to the hilt. You have a blade that's rotating in place. A lot of things are happening. Because of that, that would also explain why the fight between Obi-Wan and Vader is not the, you know, beat up to hell kind of fight that you see in future movies. Not only Empire Strikes Back, but obviously in the prequels where they really hammer each other with these blades. In Star Wars, it looks more like, <laughs> it kind of looks like a bunch of old guys just kind of taking it easy on each other, which, you know, we kind of, it's one of those things that we're like, we, we question, but we kind of say, well, okay, well, they're, you know, they're fighting a certain style, like samurai. And the samurai, you know, they don't do these acrobatics. There's, they're just boom, 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 step back, boom, 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 step back, you know, that kind of thing. Okay. You know what? We went with it and we accepted it. But in all reality, that was part of the issue, was that if you start beating each other over the head with these things, they're going to fall apart the second you make contact. So they had to kind of slow it down a little bit. So while this is happening, you know, while they're filming all the, you know, especially the duel, the duel between Vader and um, Obi-Wan, set pictures are being taken. You know, they're taking set pictures. Also, when Luke first gets introduced to the saber, he ignites it and kind of you know, flings it around a little bit. Again, they're using the same type of device with the motor and the rotation and all that stuff, and set pictures are being taken. And I believe when Luke is practicing with his lightsaber in the Falcon, again, same device. Well, the problem is that when they started to look at the footage of these lightsabers, and if you really think back to the Macquarie paintings, there is a slight, slight color tint to the lightsabers, but nowhere near what we end up with. Uh, Vader on his painting has a, a very slightly bluish tint to it, and Luke has a kind of like a white tint, almost yellow whitish tint. Now, it is conceivable, again, I don't know for sure, that, that they purposely made these tints in the Macquarie painting on purpose to differentiate the swords, but something tells me also that it has to do with the color of the outfit that they're wearing. For example, Vader is wearing a dark, black bluish kind of outfit and if the blade is standing in front of him which like he it's depicted on the painting it would kind of you would kind of figure that that color would kind of bleed into the, the the lightsaber it would reflect into the lightsaber especially if it's very white luke on the other hand and the rest of that painting it's kind of yellowish colors you figure that again you have a white blade that is reflecting off the yellow so it's giving it a slight yellow tint so my opinion here is that originally these lightsabers were supposed to be just plain white. There was not supposed to be any color variation in them. Now, granted, they could put some sort of, uh, you know, whatever reflective color they're using, they could tint it slightly to give it a little hazy color, but you were never going to get the colors that we got now, those bright, bright laser colors. So they tried it. And um, I guess when they were looking at the film, they realized this isn't working. The color is not bright enough. It's not reflecting enough. It's not powerful enough. And there are certain times when a certain angle is reached with the sword where you can see there's a stick inside. It's not a solid beam of light the way that they wanted it to be. You could see it's a stick. There's a stick no matter what you do to it. So at that point is when they decided, all right, we need to try something new. They've already shot all the footage. They couldn't reshoot it again, I believe. So what they did is they decided, all right, we're going to go and rotoscope, you know, airbrush all these colors into the lightsaber. And we're going to, since we are going to go that far into actually having to manually do this frame by frame, we're going to go and just give it more identifiable colors so we are able to tell apart, again, the good guy from the bad guys. We'll, we have a myth now, and it's the bad guys are going to be in the red, and the good guys are going to be in the blues. So Luke and Obi-Wan are blues, Vader is red. Perfect. It works. It looked fantastic. Now, don't get me wrong. It looks absolutely fantastic, you know, the finished product. But keep in mind that the finished product was not the original intent. The finished product was something that they had to come up with to fix their plan A. So it's more of a plan B. Now, with that said, there are certain shots still, especially in A New Hope, where even though they were able to rotoscope the proper color on it, when the tip of the lightsaber is aiming at the camera, 
you still see a very distinct rod looking thing. And there are certain shots, like way, way in the background, where they just either didn't bother or didn't do it enough, or because it's so far away and you have foreground elements, they didn't want to have it bleed over other things. What I'm talking about is, for example, after Vader kills Obi-Wan, and he starts walking towards the camera, let's say. But the doors start closing in front of him because Luke shoots the door. Yeah, shoot the door, kid. You know, that kind of thing. Luke, shoot the door. Remember that? So he can block Vader. As the doors are closing, Vader is walking and you can see him holding his lightsaber. But you don't really see that red anymore. You see kind of like a whitish looking color. Again, my theory is that... The best ways to rotoscope these things in are when they're the only things on camera. The fact that you have doors that are closing and overlapping on the sword, you have other stormtroopers around there, around Vader, and then you have other stormtroopers in front of Vader. I think there was just too much clutter for them to be able to, you know, color, don't color, color, don't color. That kind of precise coloring would have looked a little clunky. I would have called attention to itself. So I think they kind of purposely said, all right, the doors are closing. Everything is shutting down. People are not paying that much attention. Let's just keep going. And later on, you know, again, when you see some set pictures, you start to realize, oh, uh, how come the, the sword looks different? You know, things look different. This looks different. That looks different. That's all related to the fact that when they first were doing it, they had to use these specific props. Now, the idea of a battery pack, it's funny because either by accident or by doing the same type of research I did, at some point in some of these older EU books, you know, when they were designating, you know, where they were inventing the history of the lightsaber as far as fiction goes, like I said before, these could have been tools in the past. They were adapted to something else. But in some drawings I've seen, it might have been comics or, or art for a book, they show you that uh, these ancient uh, Jedi, they would have a lightsaber with a wire that would attach to a little belt pack power uh, cell on their belt and they were fight that way and they would have to be very careful not to cross the wires as they're fighting because yes you cross the wire you cut the wire and guess what you have no more power on your lightsaber so it, it's kind of funny that they they even acknowledge that in some bizarre shape or form you know through the eu now the toys you know when kids saw this thing and again we're seeing this for the first time it might not necessarily be a, an idea that uh, that came out for the first time. I'm sure in other sci-fi books they might have mentioned people being able to to fight with some kind of a, uh, with a laser sword or a light sword or an energy sword or something like that. Yeah, I get that. But this is, for all intents and purposes, the first time that you know the mass public gets to see a visual representation of of this type of a device, of this type of a weapon. So kids go insane. I, I mean, it was just like, oh my God, this thing is amazing. I mean, it's just a, a wonderful, uh, new toy, potential toy for children. And they did. They put out a version of the lightsaber. Now, today we are super spoiled, obviously, because the type of materials, and I'm, you know, I'm holding my, my master replica here in my hands right now. It is just, uh, it's a work of art. And I know that they make better ones, and I know they make custom ones that are, mechanically electronically much better than this but just to hold this thing and to feel its weight you feel like this is what the the actors must have felt like when they they're holding you know they're it's just incredible but back in 77 78 you know when the products first start coming out the first version of a lightsaber for kids to do actual battle with came in the form of this Yellow inflatable lightsaber. <laughs> now, I've seen pictures of this thing. Uh, I, I, I might have actually seen them in a convention. And it is just, uh, I mean, I got to keep saying to myself, it's the 70s. It's the beginning. They, they, they were making it up as they went along. It was super safe. I'll give it that. It was the safest possible toy <laughs> probably out there because you all you, you know, you, you're inflating this thing and your, your friend is inflating his and you're inflating yours. And now you can kind of sword fight with an inflatable thing. And I'm sure that after the third strike, the air will start to leak out. And by, I don't know, a minute or two or three into your fight, you're left with this limp, piece of plastic, you know, rubbery plastic that just kind of looks weirdly, uh, you know, disgustingly obscene or something. But hey, 
that's what kids had and they, and, and, and they made it work. <laughs> they made it work. Now, granted, I'm sure a lot of other kids were just grabbing broomsticks or any piece of any, any kind of long projectile looking item from the home and beating each other over the head with them, pretending to be lightsabers. Yes, of course, that always happens. But as far as Lucasfilm went and Kenner went, this was their first introduction into, you know, here's our version of the lightsaber for kids. And like I said, and it was super safe because it's a soft, you know, inflatable material. By the time Empire Strikes Back comes out, you have an interesting situation now. First of all, the films, they have completely abandoned the rotating mechanism because they realized it didn't work in the first film. All we need to do is put some kind of rod that the actors can, you know, kind of go to town on a little bit more, you know, reinforce that rod so they can actually beat each other pretty hard. And then we'll just rotoscope it like we ended up doing in the first place. So that's what they ended up doing on the film. You know, you still have Luke with blue, Vader with red. Okay, pretty, pretty solid. So for the toy market, what they then end up doing is putting out a new version of the lightsabers for kids to play with. And these I do remember seeing at the stores, but I kind of passed on them. I remember it wasn't really my, my type of thing. What you got here is an item that is pretty true to its length. All made out of plastic. The hilt is plastic. The blade is plastic. The blade is pretty thick. And the hilt is pretty thick. Thicker than what it normally would be. The blade is either yellow or red. Now, I know that's a little weird because there were no yellow lightsabers. Just like the inflatable one, it was yellow. You had no choice. The extra feature that this thing had, which was a little bonus thing that the inflated one obviously couldn't, is that built into the hilt, I guess, there were a series of holes that if you moved or turned the hilt in a certain circular direction, it would create this hum, high-pitched, whistly kind of sound to kind of simulate the lightsaber hum. Obviously, it sounded nowhere near what it did, but at least it made a noise. That you could say, all right, it's kind of making that noise. So kids were able to buy those in those two different colors. And then there were even, you know, there were commercials for them. I even saw, I remember seeing a toy commercial with, where they would show you the Yoda puppet from Empire and the lightsaber. And it was kind of like Luke training with Yoda. Even though the only time I think Luke takes his lightsaber is when he goes to the cave. I don't think he actually takes the lightsaber in front of Yoda at any point, or at least in any non-deleted scene, because there were some deleted scenes that had Luke engage, you know, activating his lightsaber for one of his exercises, but that that's a whole other story. But once again, we have this going on where it's like, wait, what's the on with this yellow stuff? Well, the problem with the yellow lightsaber is something that also followed them to the action figure line. As you guys might remember, the Star Wars three and three quarter inch Luke action figure with the lightsaber, whether it's the telescoping lightsaber that comes out of his arm or the more standard, you know, one piece one, they made him yellow. Hmm. That's interesting. Their 12 inch dolls, you know, their line of 12 inch dolls had a similar situation, except it gets a little weird. The Luke Skywalker 12 inch doll came with a blue lightsaber. It's a very short little stubby little lightsaber, but the Obi-Wan Kenobi lightsaber, which is blue in film, came with a yellow lightsaber. Okay, that makes perfectly no sense at all. Furthermore, the Obi-Wan Kenobi three and three quarter inch comes with a blue lightsaber. So you have to kind of try to follow this. Little Luke yellow, big Luke blue. Big Ben yellow, little Ben blue. <laughs> try to make heads and tails of how and why they went in that direction. And the only way you can kind of try to make any heads or tails of this is you have to think about what Kenner was supplied with when they were manufacturing these lightsabers, these these particular props. Now, you figure early, earlier in the movie, they might only have set pictures. And the set pictures, whether they're, whether they're black and white or color, are not going to show any rotoscoping, obviously, because that was done later in special effects. All they have is pictures of the guys holding the sword and the rotating device attached to the sword. If it's a black and white picture, you have no idea what's happening because it's black and white. If it's a color picture, you're going to get the same effect more or less than the camera crew with the film stock being shot is going to have. And that is a lightsaber that has a white, maybe slightly yellowish tone to it. 
but it's primarily white. It's almost like a like a fluorescent tube that you know that kind of white that that's the effect they were getting, which wasn't working out too well. So it is possible that the reason they went with yellow was because at the time they were all supposed to be the same kind of color, and they kind of went in that direction. And a white lightsaber, a white piece of plastic, might have been a little too weird. They might have wanted it to tint it a little bit, now, especially since Luke has a white tunic. You really maybe didn't want to have white tunic with a fleshy hand with a white rod protruding out of his arm, so they kind of made it a different color. Now, again, that doesn't explain why Vader has red and has the proper red, <laughs> both on the three and three quarter and on the 12 inch doll. So the lack of logic is what's logical almost about it is that some of them, they got it exactly right. Some of them, they got them half right. And some of them, they got them completely wrong. It's just a very mishmash of why is this whole yellow thing still in the mix? And you also figured that by the time you get to Empire, everybody knows we're doing blue and red, blue and red, blue and red, blue and red. Why would they then manufacture a yellow plastic lightsaber when they already knew that we're not dealing in yellows anymore? That's part of the mystery. And this lightsaber issue, especially with the smaller ones, continued through the action figure line. Empire Luke still got a yellow lightsaber. Return of the Jedi Luke got a blue lightsaber when all of a sudden Return of the Jedi gets a green lightsaber. You know, you, you figure by, again, by Empire, why are we still giving out yellows when they should be blues? And by Return of the Jedi, why are we giving blues when we should have greens? Now, somewhere down the line, they did start manufacturing green lightsabers for the Return of the Jedi, Jedi Luke. As a matter of fact, the pop-up R2-D2 that has the hidden lightsaber that pops up is green. So, again, there is some kind of disconnect. Now, what I'm trying to explain here is also that the fact for the disconnect on Jedi might have something to do with the film's trailer. It's been suggested and, you know, backed up by some footage that we found out there that the reason why Kenner might have thought that Luke was going to have a blue lightsaber during this film is because of a number of things. First of all, the Revenge of the Jedi poster has Luke and Vader fighting uh, with blue and red. Granted, they have the wrong color on the wrong character. Don't know why. We don't know if it's a mistake or it's done on purpose to, to make people think that Vader is going to turn good and Luke is going to turn bad. I don't know. Maybe it's just an error from the artist or the somebody told them to do it the wrong way. Who knows? But at least they're giving you a heads up that we're sticking with blue and red. Another possibility here is that if you guys look at the trailer for Revenge of the Jedi and they're introducing the characters, once they go through Luke Skywalker and they show you these different shots, there's a shot there of him standing on Jabba's sail barge, fighting off his goons, and he has a blue lightsaber. So you're like, wait a minute, that's not green. And that shot takes place after R2 popped, you know, the lightsaber and gave it to him. That's as blue as blue gets. There is no green about it whatsoever. Well, the theory going around is that here's the problem. Once they were tweaking the colors, they realized that when you have a blue lightsaber against a blue sky, it's going to diminish its its look. You're going to have a problem with the colors. Blue against blue kind of mixes. So they needed a way to have Luke's lightsaber pop some more. Now, granted, blue against red would have worked in the Emperor's Chamber. That's no problem at all. We can have a fight in there because it's all black and dark and there are no blues, really, more or less. But there's no sky blue. But guess what? Out in the desert, in Tatooine, sky blue is practically the same color as the lightsaber. So I think what happened is that at that point, once again, they realized, oh, crap, we got a problem. We got to switch colors now. So then they decided, let's throw green in the mix. Okay, that might have been why they at first gave you a blue lightsaber for Luke for the action figure, and then later switched it to green because they realized, oh, crap, here we go again. We got the wrong color. Well, at least they didn't give him yellow this time. I mean, you know, you figure after after about six years, they kind of got the color right. <laughs> well, almost right. At least they got rid of a color that never existed. Let's put it that way. So, you know, that explains that issue. Now, with these larger plastic role-playing uh, swords, 
lightsabers, they manufactured one more color. And you figured, well, all right, well, maybe they finally gave you a blue one for kids to be Luke during, like, Empire stuff. No, no, they they, they kind of didn't ever make a blue one, but they did make a green one at some point. So uh, now, as far as your selections for large size uh, role-playing, you know, the ones that are plastic and they make that humming sound when you kind of shake them around a little bit, you got your yellow, you got your red, and you got your green. And that was the end of that. Those, I believe, were called the Force lightsaber. And and in the commercial, it says, like, if you uh, hold them a certain way and make them move around, you will actually hear the Force. Oh, you hear the Force. And it's like, <laughs> weird sound. <laughs> oh, my God. Well, that's what we had as far as lightsabers went, you know, to play with by the time we're done with the original trilogy. Now. Between the original trilogy and the prequels, well, there's a period of darkness <laughs> that we refer to as the dark times, obviously, which is that there's absolutely no production being done. Everything is shut down. A couple of books are being pumped out, some role-playing games, you know, maybe some tops cards. I don't know if there are even, even comics happening. You know, just not much going on. Then all of a sudden, when Lucas starts to get involved again, in the toy business and in the special edition business that is going to eventually lead to the prequel business. All of a sudden, then, everything ramps up again. And that's when you have what's called the the beginning of the power of the Force, which is kind of the same name as the last wave of Kenner toys. But this is the revival. You know, this is the new power of the Force or, or power of Force 2, sometimes it's called, of toys that start to come out and they start remaking all of them. This is when we had all those, you know, Beefy, chunky, you know, roid rage looking Luke and Leia and Solo with these huge, massive chests and little tiny, uh, waists. And, you know, the line starts to rev up again. It's getting hot again. And you, then we start to see a slew of lightsabers. You have plastic grips, realistic looking plastic grips with blades that you can kind of snap and the blade pops out of itself it's called, it's like a it's almost like a double telescoping but it's like a triple or quadruple telescope it's a telescoping kind of blade that you can make it pop out and then later on they have ones where you can actually press a button and a spring makes the blade boop, 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 you know come out a little bit it's all plastic and then at some point they add lights so you can actually see them light up if you're pressing a button and you can even at a certain point have sound effects you know they'll make a certain sound when you pop them open and, and you activate them and this this is going on until now. You know, you can still buy all kinds of plasticky, specially made for kids, realistic looking uh, blades. Uh, now, granted, they're not ever going to be at this point the exact length of what a real one looks like because there's a certain amount of strength that you need on the blade itself. And because they know that kids are going to just beat each other over the head with these things, they have to make them sturdy enough in a manner where... They will just not collapse, so they do have to sacrifice some of the look of it and the feel of it in order to make them sturdier for kids. And they've, they've had, and I can't go into them because there's so many of them that it's just ridiculous, the amount of blades, the amount of configurations. You can make your own blade. You can cr create your own hilts. You can, you know, there's a bazillion of them. But as far as I'm concerned, the next step in the collectible, you know, if you want to call them toy or collectible, came with the Master Replica effect series. The specific ones I'm talking about are the ones that are hilt and blade. And you hit a button and the blade lights up in the same manner that a blade would light up on the screen. Obviously, it's not that you're going from nothing to full. The blade is already there. It just lights up. They haven't created a real laser yet, you know, for this sort of thing. But these blades light up. They make the humming sound, the actual humming sound. They make the clash sound. And, you know, they actually react to pressure, to being hit. You know, you hear that, that pressure, that, that crackling sound, you know, when, when it's hit against something else, another lightsaber or another. Now, granted, these are somewhat fragile. You can hit a little bit, you know, with someone else. But if you were to have a, a, a realistic, a cinema realistic fight, odds are you're going to break some of that because it, it is not meant, really not meant to really go to town on them. Now, at the same time as these are being produced, you have others that are being produced even before, which is just hilt, replica hilts. 
different companies, including Master Replica. They come up with their own different sizes, you know, real size, miniatures, all types of sizes, beautiful, beautiful looking hilts. But as far as I'm concerned, I'm going to go over some of the ones that are full-blown uh, replicas, you know, top to bottom. Well, the first thing to keep in mind is that under the Master Replica license ran from 2002 to 2007 for these particular effects sabers. The way that I got the sabers was, as usual, I only <laughs> wanted to buy one. And I wanted to buy one as a gift for my wife, which was the Mace Windu saber, the purple one. Because it, it was just so different looking. You know, the color was just a all of a sudden a new color in the mix and everything. And that kind of started spiraling. Well, she got one. I Then I got one for myself. And then I got another one. And then I got another one. And then I have a whole collection. But they released quite a number of them. But I did not necessarily buy them all. My theory was... Like it is with a lot of my collecting, you know, I have to create my own rules. This way I don't become a completist, which don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with being a completist, except it's very expensive and time consuming and space consuming. Let's start off with Anakin Skywalker. They produced what could be considered to be Anakin Skywalker's lightsaber. But specifically, they are the one obviously from Attack of the Clones and the one from Revenge of the Sith. They are pretty much similar in how they look. Keep in mind, the one from Revenge of the Sith is theoretically the one that gets passed down to Luke. With that said, they created a Luke Skywalker saber from Star Wars and then one from Empire Strikes Back. So again, I don't believe these are supposed to be complete rebuilds, like made from scratch, as far as the canon goes, the history of the lightsaber itself. You know, Anakin does lose a lightsaber in Geonosis, if you think about it. I believe the uh, machine cuts it in half or destroys it or something like that. But later when he fights with Dooku, you know, he has his own lightsaber, which I believe might have came from one of the other Jedis. And then obviously in Revenge of the Sith, he's got a brand new one, which as far as the style, it's pretty much exactly like the other one. So... My personal take on it was, you know what, I don't need to buy all the different, you know, iterations of this lightsaber when they might have maybe modified a, a button here, a button there, a switch here, a switch there. I just have one, which is good enough for me. It represents that lightsaber that gets handed down, you know, to Luke Skywalker. Then I have a Vader lightsaber. The Vader one has come out a total of three times. Uh, there's actually two different versions for the Star Wars one and one version for the Empire Strikes Back one. They did not release one under the Return of the Jedi banner, if you will. There's a Yoda lightsaber, which is really cool and small. It does everything else that the other lightsabers do as far as the sound effects, you know, the, the, the clashing sounds, you know, everything, the light up feature, except it's much smaller because it's supposed to be Yoda's height. Then I have the Mace lightsaber, which is, the like I mentioned earlier, the first one I ever got. I also got the Ventress one, which is a offshoot, if you will, because it is not exactly uh, cinematic. <laughs> it's, it's more of a B-level canon. I mean, I know it's canon as far as, you know, Lucasfilm is concerned, but it, it did come more from a, a cartoon source, an animated source. And that's a weird one because uh, just like in the show, you could buy two and attach them back to back. So you could create that kind of like an S-shape uh, lightsaber that she sometimes uses. But I didn't go that far with that one. That one I just said, all right, you know what? Let's just do one because it's, it's a good example of something that's there. Then I got a Dooku one, which is gorgeous because if you guys remember, you know, it's got more elaborate gold and it has the curve and it has the, the little protector section in the front. You know, it's it's a much more ornate type of lightsaber. Then you have the Luke Return of the Jedi saber. Now, this is one that obviously is the green one from Return of the Jedi. It looks pretty close to it. There are certain areas that could they, they could not manufacture exactly the same way because of the limitations of the uh, electronics, but I'll get into that in a little bit. And you have the Darth Maul saber, which is the double-ended classic, you know, straight 
Darth Maul one that is sold individually. You know, you, you, you buy one and then you buy another one and then you connect the two and I have it displayed in that manner as a connected, you know, two-way saber. Then I have from Hasbro because in 2007, when the license ran out with Master Replica, Hasbro picked up the license at this point and started selling lightsabers too, almost identical to the Master Replica ones. Some of them uh, are pretty much identical in terms of the features and the functionality of them, but some of them they went a step further so that you could actually detach the blade and display them with just the hilt, like some of the hilt collectors that just have hilts this way you have you know two different functions on these so what i have is an obi-wan kenobi saber from revenge of the sith this is the one that does not look like the one in a new hope this one looks a little different the grip is different the bottom of it is different the color is the same it's still blue if you remember the film but it just looks different i have a kit fisto lightsaber which is one of these removable blade types. It's the only one I own that I can remove the blade. And the latest one that I have is the Kylo Ren one from Force Awakens, which has the dual emitters on the side, the venting emitters, and you know, and it is different in terms of it, it makes a different kind of sound, a more of a crackly, unstable sound, which is all part of its profile, if you will. Now, Here's something to keep in mind when it comes to these sabers, both the Master Replicas and the Hasbro's, but specifically the Master Replicas. Because of the electronics and the, the, the way that they needed to build these things, they are much fatter than the actual props, some more than others. For example, the Dooku saber, the Ventress saber, they are way, way fatter than the real props. Part of it, I imagine, like I said, it's because of the electronics, and especially when you try to curb the saber, the way that these things have to be able to withstand, you know, all these different dimensions is to make them fatter. Also, to be able to insert a battery compartment inside of these things, you know, they can, they they also you also lose a little bit probably of of, of space. Uh, to be able to shave off of it and they have to add more, you know, to be able to accommodate that. And the sound emitter. You got to remember, you also have a sound emitter inside the the actual device. So, you you know, there's a lot of electronics going on in there. So that is something that you kind of sacrifice a little bit. If you look at pictures of props that the actors are holding, they're way, way thinner. Now, some of them are pretty close, don't get me wrong. You know, some of them, they, they do feel, especially, I would say, the Hasbro ones. I think they were able to make them a little bit thinner and better, not the Kylo Ren. The Kylo Ren is a monster because it is just so full of electronics that they, you know, you have to go a little fatter on that one. Another thing to keep in mind, which is a little complicated, is Obi-Wan Kenobi. Master Replica put out an Obi-Wan Kenobi lightsaber. It is technically super, super similar to the Return of the Jedi Luke lightsaber. It has a very, very different piece in it that makes it a little different, but it's almost identical to it. And I never got it because to me it looked, it was, it looked too much like the Return of the Jedi saber. But I never made a connection that I found out very recently. One of the problems also with the Return of the Jedi saber if you remember it in close-up, if you will, the first thing you're going to find is that it looks a lot like the Obi-Wan Kenobi one, okay? Including the very tip of it, you know, it gets to a point, the way that it is constructed, as far as architecturally, let's say, is that when you get close to the tip, there's a section that becomes very thin and then round and then thin again and round, you know, th there are these very thin points in it. And for these particular FX sabers, they could not replicate that because it was way, way, way too thin to be able to put all the, again, the electronics and the strength that you need this thing to be able to be wielded and slapped around a little bit, not completely, you know, beat over the head with <laughs> type of strength. So what they did is they made it fatter, specifically this little brown, uh, orangey section near the tip. Which, again, when you look at the original one, you're going to start to notice, yeah, that is that is so much different, and they had to go that way. And I never bothered, because, again, I wanted to avoid buying almost exactly the same thing 
twice. Even if it's wielded by somebody else, I don't want, you know, that thing. I didn't want three different or five different, you know, Anakin slash Luke Skywalker lightsabers. I didn't want that. So the thing that you have to keep in mind about the Obi-Wan lightsaber is that it has a very unusual behind the scenes history. And that is, if you look and again, I, I just found this out by digging around on the internet for some information and some videos that I watched, and somebody pointed it out that if you look at some of the behind-the-scenes photos from Return of the Jedi, specifically the sandstorm scene in the beginning of Return of the Jedi that was deleted, obviously you can go through the books or you can watch the deleted scenes and the behind-the-scenes stuff on the Blu-ray that they put out, there are pictures of Luke holding his Bespin lightsaber. But there's also pictures of him holding or carrying in some shape or form what looks like to be more of the final lightsaber that he ends up using in Return of the Jedi, which is the green one, completely different looking lightsaber. Well, for a while, you know, we couldn't figure out, you know, nobody could figure out what's the point. Why is he holding it? I mean, he should not be even touching that lightsaber, that that. Empire Strikes Back saber because he lost it. It fell. Remember, it fell and it hasn't been recovered. I don't know how on the hell it was recovered for The Force Awakens. That's a whole other issue <laughs> that we we can't really talk about right now. But we have to go under the assumption that he does not have access to it. But for some reason, they're ready to shoot Return of the Jedi. And all of a sudden, on his hands is this lightsaber. And the theory going around is that, you know... That they brought, like, I guess all the lightsabers that they had available at the time. You know, they weren't manufacturing new lightsabers at that point. They just had what they had. And then they must have realized on set or during rehearsals or doing something that, wait a minute, we got a problem here. He's not supposed to have this lightsaber. What do we do now? Well, what's been theorized, and it looks very certain at this point, is that instead what they did is they grabbed the old Obi-Wan Kenobi saber and maybe slightly modified it, did a little tiny tweak, but the basic body of it is what Luke will be holding now for Return of the Jedi, as if he had constructed that at some point, you know, completely on his own. He is, after all, in Tatooine, so in theory, he could go back to Ben's home and look for parts and assemble a brand new lightsaber because he lost the other one. He can't just make one out of nowhere. He probably doesn't have the knowledge or the parts, you know. At this point in the story, we don't have this whole thing about you got to find your own kyber crystal and, and it, you identify it and it identifies you, you know, all that Clone Wars stuff. We really don't have that. So... It's a matter of building one from scratch, and not everybody can build one. He he probably needs to go to Ben's house and figure out, or maybe he has it written somewhere, or there is some kind of instruction manual <laughs> on how to do this. And Ben must have some parts laying around where he can kind of cobble together his own lightsaber. Now, that's a good theory. And the way that this theory is backed up is that there was a program recently about collectors, and uh, one of the things they did is they presented, you know, to look at, to be able to hold uh, Mark Hamill, a lightsaber that he used during Return of the Jedi. And when they handed it to him, you know, it looked exactly like what it was, but it also was very reminiscent of Obi-Wan. And the actual owner, you know, who owns this new lightsaber, I forget how he got it and his hands on it, but he says that when he bought it, one of the things he noticed off the bat, you know, it was an authentic Return of the Jedi prop used lightsaber that Mark Hamill used during the majority of the film. But what he noticed was that there were electronic parts on the hilt, actual electronics inside, and that where the blade would start, now keep in mind, he doesn't, we're talking about the hilt here, we're not talking about the entire sword, just the hilt, the prop that he will be holding, you know, hanging from his belt. But the area where the sword part, the blade would start to go up, in there, there was a rotating mechanism without the blade. So basically what that probably means is that this was Obi-Wan's lightsaber with the blade removed. The old one with the electronics that they basically, at the last second when they kind of realized that all of a sudden, oh crap, we don't have an extra lightsaber to give Luke. What are we going to do? We can't just give him the same one and assume that he reconstructed the exact same one. The reconstruction... 
I guess for artistic purposes, has to look a little different. Well, guess what? They made it look like Obi-Wan's by giving him basically Obi-Wan's lightsaber and just removing the mechanics, you know, the electronics and the blade. So that is a very unusual thing when you think about it. And it's very old and beat up, the one that he used, because that's the one they actually used in the film. Later, in Return of the Jedi, there are certain scenes where you do get close-ups of that lightsaber. I think when Vader is holding it, admiring it, or or somebody's holding it really tight, you know, for a close-up, they build a, a replica of that, but it looks super shiny, super new. But the one that Luke will be using for the majority of the shoots, where the sword is just hanging and he's just holding it, you know, it will be most likely the original Obi-Wan Kenobi saber. So... It's a weird scenario that behind the scenes, they basically repurpose Obi-Wan's saber for a Return of the Jedi. Now, you might say to yourself, well, how do we then explain story-wise? Not reality, because reality, we, we talked about this before. The fact that he has a green blade is probably most likely due to the problem with the blue. Blue against blue is a problem. Blue lightsaber, blue sky, technical problem. Change it to green so it pops out. Okay, fine. How do we then, story-wise, justify green? Why would Luke, out of the blue, out of the blue, no pun intended, decide to go for green? Well, story-wise, what we could say is that, well, Ben had, you know, spare parts, and maybe he even had Qui-Gon Jinn's old lightsaber, or parts of it, or pieces, or whatever, that he kept because it was his old master. After he died, he kind of got, he got his lightsaber. You know, that's how he defeated Darth Maul. So... It is possible that maybe his kyber crystal is still in his home, and then Luke uses that kyber crystal to build that new saber. You know, Ben lost his saber to Darth Vader at the Death Star. Luke lost his lightsaber in Bespin. So now there are no kyber crystals laying around, except for maybe a green kyber crystal in Ben's home that used to be Qui-Gon. So that's a cute little retcon way of kind of getting it all back there. You know, it's up to you to believe whether or not you, you believe that whether or not it works for you. <laughs> now, what's interesting also is that with this lightsaber collection, Hasbro has basically redone most of these other lightsabers that Master Replica has put out. And I really haven't bothered collecting those because I don't want repeats of something else just because all of a sudden it has the possibility of a removable blade on them. You know, some do, some don't. Even if they improve the lights, even if they improve the sound and everything, it's still, you know, as far as I'm concerned, it's good enough for me. However, whenever they do put out a new Saber, that's something that I'm interested in. That's why I bought the Kid Fisto one. That's why I bought the Kylo Ren one, for example. But they have never bothered yet to put out a Qui-Gon Jinn lightsaber, a Darth Sidious lightsaber, an Ahsoka lightsaber any of the trainee lightsabers from the Padawans, those smaller ones, or the other Jedi. When they built the Kit Fisto one, that theoretically could have opened up a can of worms of possible variations to build, because for Attack of the Clones specifically, and even Revenge of the Sith, they added a lot of lightsabers, because obviously they didn't want all the Jedis to have the same lightsaber, so they, they made so many variations. Uh, granted, they're a little more generic, but they are still variations. And they could have gone in that route, but they didn't. I think they kind of held back because they realized that people probably would not be that interested, unless you're a super crazy collector, into getting every single one. But there are easily so many more. The first ones I mentioned, Qui-Gon Jinn, that's a very iconic lightsaber. It's a very large lightsaber, very long. And it is a prominent character in the film. And like I just said, theoretically, this could be the lightsaber that is holding Luke Skywalker's green lightsaber's Kyber Crystal. Whatever. <laughs> Darth Sidious, that's one that I always wish they would make because it is such an ornate, fancy looking thing. And it's part, I understand it's part of the Sith. In other words, the Jedi's lightsabers are supposed to be very plain, utilitarian, simple. But when you go to the Sith side, not so much with Vader, but with Dooku and Sidious, for example, they have much more gold pieces in them and more ornate and more fancy looking. Mace Window seems to be somewhere in the middle because, uh, the, again, his, the story is supposed to be that his particular style of, of fighting is, is leans a little more towards Sith, 
you know, it kind of balances between the two. It's not such pure. It's a little more dips into, you know, he, so, so he does have some gold accent on his lightsaber, but the, the Sidious one, at least the one, the prop that we've seen, it's, it's really nice looking and I wish they could make it. It's small. It's supposed to be a lot smaller than a regular lightsaber because he kind of keeps it tucked in in his uh, arm sleeve. You know, on his tunic. But we know that they have the technology to make them small because they did Yoda. But on the other hand, Yoda is also, if you think about it, is small in length too. So maybe it is difficult to put a small hilt with a regular sized blade. That might be the problem. Interesting. Ahsoka is another one. Uh, you know, if you make Ventress, if you make an animated character lightsaber, which is, is an interesting design, why don't you make Ahsoka? She's practically the co-star of Clone Wars. She's a super important character as far as that goes. Make that one. I mean, you can go as far with even with Rebels. You could have made some of those Rebel-inspired lightsabers too. But if they're not making Ahsoka, I'm sure they're not going to make the, these other Rebel-inspired ones. And uh, yeah, like I said, the training and the other Jedi, I understand why they wouldn't go in that direction. But the history itself, it's really cool as far as I'm concerned of lightsabers and, and collecting them. And yes, of course, I would love to be able to do the whole collection, you know, like a completist could do, but I can't. And I'm glad in a way that they kind of slow down. I like it when they, you know, you might have a year or two or three where nothing new comes out. For all I know, Hasbro might just give up on these things. Surprisingly, they did put out the uh, Kylo Ren because it is such an iconic, different looking thing. Granted, with The Last Jedi, we really didn't have any new lightsabers. So let's see. Let me think about it for a minute. No, because uh, Ray's is Luke's. In the flashback sequences, I believe Luke is using the Return of the Jedi lightsaber. From what I remember, I mean, it's a little hard to remember, but on Return of the Jedi, he throws his lightsaber away when he's fighting Vader. However, later on, when he's dragging Vader through the floor, trying to get him back into the shuttle... We do not see him having a lightsaber, which could lead us to believe that he left it behind or it fell down the ventilation shaft. But later, when he rejoins everybody in Endor at the celebration, there is a shot of him coming towards the camera, and you do see the lightsaber dangling from his belt. So that, unfortunately or fortunately, indicates that he still owns it. Once again, in The Last Jedi, if you actually do freeze frame some of those shots... Uh, not all of them, because all of them don't show you everything. There's three flashbacks, uh, you know, from like a, kind of like three points of view of what happened between him and Kylo. And there is one where you clearly do get to see it, clearly. You know, it's a little difficult, but you do get to see it is the Return of the Jedi Saber that he has. However, later, when he does the projection at the end of the movie, he is holding his blue lightsaber, which is kind of strange because... You know, Kylo Ren already at this point knows that that lightsaber has been split in half because it happened right in front of him. But I think the explanation uh, by the director is that he, Luke is purposely doing it just to enrage him, just to kind of, the same way that he's showing himself young, is just to get him more, you know, angry and off-balanced uh, during that duel at the end. The other thing to remember is that during those flashbacks, Kylo Ren, back then Ben, is holding his own lightsaber. I guess it's a training lightsaber, or maybe it's even one he built. But there is practically no detail shown, because it happens way too fast, to get us a good look at what that would look like. You know, it's a matter of digging through archival footage or archival photos to see if anybody's willing to show us what that lightsaber looked like. So the question then becomes, what happens in the next film? in the next chapter of this trilogy, because Luke's lightsaber has been split in half. It's broken. She's going to have to build a new one. Kylo Ren still has his. Uh, so she is going to have to come up with a new lightsaber. And maybe at that point, they will release a brand new one, which I'll probably end up getting at that point. But at the same time, like I said, they have remade most of these. So, you know, they're not slowing down. They're just not making anything new. And it, obviously, it is also much cheaper for them, I imagine, just to recycle old stuff. You know, just rebuild it, put your sticker on it, and there you go. All said and done. Lightsabers has always been one of these little fascinating things that I have. And, and there's a couple of books out specifically about lightsabers. They're kind of kiddie-ish books that came out over the years. And one is basically an update of the of the last one. They were both by Pablo Hidalgo, who, you know, if you guys know... Star Wars stuff. 
having to do with uh, coming up with stories, you know, the reasons for stuff that happens or technical aspects of something. He's usually the guy, he and Leland Chi are the ones who are always coming up with this stuff. But uh, a number of years ago, under the Scholastic banner, they put out this. It's a very kind of small book, came out in 2010, and it's all about... Uh, lightsabers and you know you, you go through all of them and they give you pictures and examples of what they look like and this and that and it was a cool little book uh, that gives you all that information and very recently I believe it was earlier this year they put an updated version of it now it's the same shape it's a very thin kind of book but this one was a was hardcover updated to include The Force Awakens uh, because, like I said before, Last Jedi really doesn't have anything new as far as lightsabers go. But there are some Last Jedi pictures inside and posters and that sort of thing, which, you know, updates everything. And it has a couple of posters of all the lightsabers shown at once. Even Grievous, you know, they show you all the ones he's carrying that he stole from other dead Jedi or whatever. So it's really cool. I had done a project like this a very long time ago. Just for myself, uh, I started collecting pictures off the Internet of lightsabers and trying to match them up with who they belong to. And I did a, a, like a little database, computerized database of pictures and names. This is so-and-so. This is that person. This is that, this person, and that, you know, that whole thing. And, you know, it, it also helps if you go through the uh, visual dictionaries. The visual dictionaries are also very good at that because you also see how sometimes, like, for example, uh, Mace Windu, you know, even though you probably barely see it or not see it at all, for the visual dictionaries, they have him posing with a lightsaber. And then they have him posing with a different one. And then another one. You know, they, they, they show you the different variations of whether, again, whether you see it or not, it doesn't matter. The point is that they assigned him something. But not much of a story behind it. Why is it? Is it just a, an aesthetic decision to change it? Oh, well, we don't want to do that. Let's do that. Let's do this. Let's do that. You know, that kind of stuff. So... It's very cool also, like I said, to go through those books. And on the internet, you know, you have so many pictures, especially w with the Battle of Geonosis. You have all the different Jedis with all those different uh, lightsabers. So it's a subject that is kind of uh, fascinating uh, to kind of keep up with it and to every now and then update it. And every now and then, because we have so much already built about this story, that anything new is just like one more little point to add and one more little point. These books that I just talked about, these little thin lightsaber books... I'm sure they'll come up with, they could do another one. Would it be worth it? Would people buy a, yet another one? <laughs> I don't know. But I think we pretty much know that with the standalone films so far, unless they dip into the Ben Kenobi story, uh, we're not going to get much lightsaber action because there are no really uh, Jedi involved. And uh, the only other one I can think of was from the Solo film because Rogue One really didn't have anything. But Solo, at the end, we got that... You know, spoiler alert, mall scene, uh, where he sticks his hand out, uh, you know, on that message, uh, that he's communicating with Kira and he sticks his hand out and a lightsaber flies to his hand and we get to see what it looks like. And it is indeed a, a double a bladed lightsaber. And I believe it is styled after the animated series, which has the, the, the typical double sided, but it, it has a loop around the handle that's been cracked or it's purposely open it has like a like a half moon loop around it so yeah we did get an additional one will they manufacture that one hard to say you know it was such a quick shot such a quick scene that i would be really really surprised because that has to be a dual one and you know trying to sell a single one is hard enough trying to get people to buy two individual ones because that's what they did with darth maul saber that's a tall order you know, to expect. So I'm going to try to keep up with it. And, uh, you know, for collectors out there, there is more stuff than what I own. It's a great little collection. And it is such a fancy, fancy. I mean, like I said before, they do sell these as individual hilts by different companies, including Master Replica. And they've done gorgeous, gorgeous work. They look super 10 times better than these because since they don't have to have the electronics inside, they can make them thinner. They can make them authentically the proper dimensions. And, uh, you know, they, you have them mounted on, on, on a special frame and on a special holder. And some of them are even signed. You can have like an actor that will also sign them for you. That's how they used to sell them sometimes. But those are way, way even more expensive than these. These, for me, started out at about the $100 range, let's say. And now we're way over $100. Uh, some of them could be close to 200 bucks a piece, even more, especially for the Kylo Ren. Because the Kylo Ren one is a very large and electronically uh, a more difficultly constructed uh, lightsaber. But I absolutely love them. 
And I definitely recommend you guys look into these. Well, I hope everybody enjoyed today's show. We focused, really focused on lightsabers, obviously. Uh, this is a topic I've been wanting to talk about for a while. And it is one of these sub-collections that I have that I really appreciate the fact that they're kind of rare in terms of they don't go crazy putting them out, at least nowadays, too much. In the past, they were a little more frequent. And even with its frequency, with its older frequency, I would kind of scale it back a little bit because I could not keep up with the volume of what was coming out. So I had to kind of create my own rules as I explained uh, during our conversation. I am looking forward to the future in terms of there are so many other ones they could come out with. There's so many they didn't bother yet. And I, I wish they would return to them at some point. Unfortunately to me, it seems like nowadays they just want to focus on, on the newer, bigger items. So. You know, I don't see them dipping back into older ones that were never made. I hope they would, but I, I don't really see them doing that. I think they are waiting for newer movies with very noticeable lightsabers, you know, brand new ones, or just recycling older ones that were never recycled before under the Hasbro banner. So on behalf of everybody here, thank you for listening, and we will see you here soon at GeekFest Rants. Bye-bye, everybody. Can everyone gather around, please? You have all successfully passed the gathering and harvested your crystals. So, when do we start to build our sabers? Place your crystals on the table. Your lesson begins now. May I introduce you to architect and lightsaber designer, Huang. are them. I swear they get younger every expedition. All have passed the gathering? Yes, sir. Are you sure? But he's a droid. You expect us to learn from a droid? Who said that? Many years I have been on this ship, teaching many a Jedi before you, and I will continue teaching many a Jedi after you. Call me what you want, but inside my memory banks, I contain a record of every lightsaber ever made, and the Jedi who fashioned them. Which will you choose? A simple grip? The curved approach? One inlaid with the bone of the Cartusian whale? Bastilian ore or black oak? Well? From battles of Rashfond to the peacekeeping of Parliok to our very own Clone Wars, the lightsaber is a Jedi's only true ally. But how do they work? Yes, you have brought me crystals, but they're all useless unless you give them life. Do you know how to awaken the force within the crystal? No? Then I suggest you listen and learn until you think of a question this droid cannot answer. If you would like to subscribe to our show, send us messages, or see video links to some of the topics we talked about today, please visit our homepage at geekfestrants.com or our YouTube channel, Facebook page, or iTunes at Geekfest Rants. I don't know what we're yelling about! Geekfest Rants is produced by Carlos Perone, copyright 2018. <laughs>is part of the IC Robots radio network. Visit icrobots.com for this and many other nerd slash nostalgia related podcasts. You won't be sorry for long. <laughs>